What does a satirical fable about the governor of New Jersey have to do with the First Amendment? That's ahead this week on Footnoting History. Hello and welcome to Footnoting History. My name is Nathan. Uh, in today's episode of the podcast, I'd like to talk about four words in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. In case you've never taken the time to read it, the amendment says this, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. What I want to focus on is that phrase, or of the press. Grammatically, the phrase is joined by a comma to what comes immediately before it, or abridging the freedom of speech, comma, or of the press. But what exactly was meant by freedom of the press when this amendment was drafted and ratified in 1791? Well, first we need to deal with some terminology, because press doesn't just mean what we today would call news. Press, for the framers, meant printers and the freedom of the press meant the ability of printers to create and distribute texts that were critical of institutions of power, provided that those criticisms were true. Our story actually begins with the invention of the movable type printing press in the mid-15th century. Uh, the creation of the press was utterly revolutionary for European culture. Texts could be created and disseminated to a wide audience at a rate that was exponentially faster than the method of copying by hand. What came from it was an information revolution. Texts that were previously found in only a few manuscripts in monastery libraries now existed in hundreds or thousands of copies. But as the volume of text in print increased, what was lost was the traditional authority over which texts were the most accurate or important. In the Middle Ages, a text was copied only if someone deemed it worthy of expending the time, energy, and resources to copy it. By 1500, any printer could print anything, regardless of whether or not previous generations would have considered that text worthwhile. Moreover, printed text did not have to be limited to books. Single sheets of text or short pamphlets could be produced with great rapidity and quickly disseminated to an increasingly literate population. And if that text happened to be critical of the government or religious institutions, well, you see where this is going. The printing press was, therefore, one of the reasons that the Protestant Reformation was so successful. Most of the criticisms that reformers had of the Catholic Church had actually been around for a long time. It was the printing press that allowed them to disseminate their ideas in pamphlets and broadsheets to a wider audience. In the 16th and 17th centuries, control over print became a major political concern, particularly since sometimes critical publications made claims that were wild fabrications or twisted the truth to present a slanted version of events in government. Thus was born the concept of libel, the printing of untrue or defamatory statements. Uh, if the statements are oral, it's considered slander. If they're written, it's libel. In Britain and elsewhere in Europe, one way that governments attempted to check this outpouring of printed material was to require government licensing for a press to operate, with the loss of one's printing license as a consequence of disseminating libelous materials particularly if those materials met the charge of seditious libel, or opinion advancing or promoting insurrection against the government. Uh, these efforts, however, were only marginally successful. Which brings us to newspapers. The earliest newspapers were printed in the Netherlands at the beginning of the 17th century, because the Dutch had rather lax laws about controlling printing. In fact, the first English-language publication that can be rightly considered a newspaper was published in the Netherlands in 1620 because of the extreme control the English government exercised over its printers. These early papers, which were sometimes called news books, tended to focus on particular political and military events, and were either published in response to those events or were, at most, published weekly. Thus was born the idea of the periodical press. Uh, English print laws greatly relaxed during the Civil War in the 1640s, and while the Puritan protectorate of Oliver Cromwell did see the return of some restrictions on the press, in the second half of the century there emerged official journals of record, or gazettes, which published the activities of the government, uh, followed by newspapers that were published on a weekly basis. Daily newspapers did not exist in England until 1702, and were frequently the subject of government interference, both direct and indirect. 
1712, for instance, the government attempted to tax English newspapers virtually out of existence with a stamp act. This charged each publication a pence per page and a shilling for each ad it contained, and massively inflated the price of broadsheets and newspapers. The situation was a little bit different in America. The first printed document in the American colonies dates to 1639, when immigrant printer Stephen Day published a broadsheet, The Oath of a Freeman, which was the oath sworn by members of the Plymouth Colony of Massachusetts. There would be no periodical press publication in the American colonies until September 1690. In that year, Massachusetts' royal governor had been ousted from office, and the subsequent provisional government had been engaging in an ill-advised attempt to invade part of neighboring Canada and Indian territories, but through financial mismanagement didn't actually have the funds to pay its soldiers. Amid this increasing chaos, Benjamin Harris of Boston printed the first American newspaper, Public Occurrences Both Foreign and Domestic. With Public Occurrences, Harris stated his purpose as ensuring that the colonists received reliable, accurate information about the actions of the Massachusetts government, particularly to solve what he called the, quote, spirit of lying which prevails among us. Unfortunately for Harris, the provincial government immediately suppressed his newspaper after just one issue, and did so using a licensing act that had been reinstated by King Charles II in 1682. It would be almost a decade and a half before another newspaper would emerge in the American colonies, when the Boston Newsletter was founded in April 1704. 1719 would see the foundation of both the Boston Gazette and the American Weekly Mercury of Philadelphia, followed by another Boston newspaper, the New England Current, which was quickly taken over in 1721 by James Franklin, brother of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin would, of course, famously work for his brother at the newspaper for a very short time, writing articles under the pseudonym Silence Do Good before striking out on his own in Philadelphia, where he became co-owner of the Pennsylvania Gazette. Almost all of these early American newspapers were deeply political foundations, and despite Benjamin Harris's original designs for public occurrences, the quality and accuracy of the reporting contained therein was incredibly variable. This was not formal journalism. In fact, no schools of journalism existed in the United States until the 20th century, and often these papers contained scathing critiques of political and religious institutions and figures. The newspapers were but a portion of the work that these printers did. Since licensing often fell under the jurisdiction of colonial governors, printers soon found themselves at odds with the very people who allowed them to practice their trade. Which brings us to John Peter Zenger. Zinger's family had immigrated to America from southern Germany. Well, at the time it was the Palatinate, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, and they did this when he was 13 years old in 1710. In his teens, he was apprenticed to William Bradford. Bradford was a printer whose son had founded the American Weekly Mercury in Philadelphia. The elder Bradford had since moved to New York City, owing in part to a falling out with the Quakers in Pennsylvania over things that he had printed. In New York, he became the official printer of the colonial government, which was extremely lucrative, and he eventually founded his own newspaper, the New York Gazette, in 1725. That same year, Zenger set up his own shop in Manhattan. In 1731, however, things began to go south for the colony of New York. That year, the colonial governor, John Montgomery, died. Until a new governor arrived, a member of the governor's council, the rather wonderfully named 70-year-old Rip Van Dam, acted as a provisional governor for a little over a year until 1732, when his replacement, the Irish Brigadier General William Cosby, arrived. It's actually kind of hard to find any historical discussion of William Cosby that paints him in a good light. He seems to be one of the most reviled figures in New York history. Upon his arrival, Cosby told Van Dam that he had to return half of the salary that Van Dam had been drawing as acting governor. Uh, Van Dam refused, and so Cosby sued him, seeking a summary judgment from the Supreme Court of New York. The Chief Justice, Lewis Morris, questioned Cosby's attempt to circumvent a jury trial, which he probably would have lost, and subsequently published his official court opinion. In response, Cosby suspended Morris from the court in April of 1733. Morris and others in New York politics began a concerted movement to oppose Cosby's governorship, but they needed a printer. Now, William Bradford relied on the colonial government for his printing, 
So instead, the anti-Cosby movement turned to John Peter Zinger, his former apprentice, who, well, frankly, needed the business. They convinced Zenger to found his own newspaper, the New York Weekly Journal, with contributions from Morris and from James Alexander, a councilman who had a long-standing personal feud with Governor Cosby. The journal was vehemently critical of Cosby's government, even going so far as to create a satirical fable about the evil governor of New Jersey. And the reason that that satire is because at the time, New Jersey was under the control of the governorship of New York. Uh, this happened because some of New Jersey's previous governors had been incredibly corrupt. Um, one was actually reported transvestite. Scandalous. One of Cosby's supporters eventually threatened Zinger with physical violence, leading Zinger to start walking around New York City armed with a sword. At this point, Morris is pro-Cosby replacement as Chief Justice, a man by the name of James DeLancey, tried to get a grand jury to indict Zenger on account of seditious libel, but failed. Eventually, Cosby declared uh, several of the journal's issues to be libelous, and Zenger was arrested and thrown in jail with bail set at the exorbitant sum of 600 pounds. When Zenger's lawyers questioned the objectivity of the pro-Cosby judges, uh, namely James DeLancey, DeLancey had them disbarred. Fortunately for Zenger, his case was taken up by another lawyer, Andrew Hamilton, um, no relation to Alexander Hamilton. When the trial began, Hamilton did not contest, much to the surprise of everyone present, that Zinger had printed the issues and words for which he had been charged with, quote, being a seditious person and a frequent printer and publisher of false news and seditious libels. You see, English law allowed judges to determine whether or not a document was libelous, and in this instance, even though the materials printed about the governor were mostly true, the jury only had to find him guilty of printing the materials. James DeLancey and his fellow judges, being in the pocket of the governor, would immediately have found the material to be libelous. Addressing the jury directly, Hamilton argued that the libel charge as it stood in English law should not apply in the colony of New York. Here, he said, were greater stakes than whether or not Zinger was the publisher of the materials. Quote, it is natural, it is a privilege, I will go further, it is a right which all free men claim, that they are entitled to complain when they are hurt. They have a right publicly to remonstrate against the abuses of power in the strongest terms, to put their neighbors upon their guard against the craft or open violence of men in authority and to assert with courage the sense they have of the blessings of liberty, the value they put upon it, and the resolution at all hazards to preserve it as one of the greatest blessings heaven can bestow. He then continued, The question before the court and you, gentlemen of the jury, is not of small or private concern. It is not the cause of one poor printer, nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it may in its consequence affect every free man that lives under a British government on the main of America. It is the best cause. It is the cause of liberty. And I make no doubt, but your upright conduct this day will not only entitle you to the love and esteem of your fellow citizens, but every man who prefers freedom to a life of slavery will bless and honor you as men who have baffled the attempt of tyranny, and by an impartial and uncorrupt verdict, have laid a noble foundation for securing to ourselves, our posterity, and our neighbors, that to which nature and the laws of our country have given us a right to liberty of both exposing and opposing arbitrary power, in these parts of the world at least, by speaking and writing truth. In essence, what Hamilton was asking for was for the jury to nullify the law. They returned with a verdict of not guilty. Zinger's case can, in some lights, be seen as the point at which the history of American and British journalism and publishing begin to diverge. The British press continued to be hobbled by the 1712 Stamp Act and was slow to recover. While there would be some attempts to curb the burgeoning American press, the Zinger case set a new colonial precedent in terms of the ability to question governmental power. And in 1765, when the British government attempted to impose a Stamp Act on the American colonies, as part of a larger program to pay for the French and Indian War and the defense of the American colonies, the American press led the charge of protest against unfair taxation without parliamentary representation. As a result of the direct attack on their livelihoods, American printers and newspapers became a unifying force in the growing independence movement, 
as papers across the colonies began to publish vociferous critiques of Parliament and of the Crown. Without the information dissemination and the open critique of the American press, it's quite possible that the American Revolution might not have been born. So, it is little surprise that, in the Constitution, between speech and the right of assembly, the framers included the freedom of the press. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. <laughs>